very delighted to uh, introduce Anish. Anish is an assistant professor at the Department of Atmospheric Oceanic Sciences at the University of Colorado. He uh, also was at San Diego and in Oxford, so he has um, uh, worked both in Europe and here. Um, he has many research interests uh, around uh, climate prediction, data assimilation, um, coupled, um, coupled processes and parameterization development. He has worked uh, in the uh, modeling of the Madden-Julian oscillation. And, uh, um, and uh, um, I think uh, one of the, the work that stands out is um, uh, his studies on uh, climate change impacts on the MJO and how the physical and uh, Im Im improvements of the physical parameterization schemes and stochastic parameterizations uh, can help with the representation of MJO in the tropics. Anish, I'm looking very forward to your talk and please do take the full 30 minutes. Thank Great. you. Thank you, Judith. So yeah, I'll be talking about um, exploring physical and um, a little bit towards the end of the machine learning methods as well for stochastic modeling and ensemble prediction of weather and climate. And here I um, say weather and climate, which is essentially a continuum where S2S is the bridge between weather and climate. Um, I would like to acknowledge and thank um, all my colleagues and collaborators uh, who have contributed to much of the work I'll be presenting. A lot of the work um, on stochastic modeling, I started when I was um, in Tim Palmer and Antje's uh, group at Oxford in collaboration with Frederick, um, Peter Bechtol and um, Magdalena at ECMWF. I'll be presenting some results uh, from Will Chapman, who's uh, a student as in the school as well. It's been a, a, a real pleasure to work with Will for the past um, half a decade. Um, and then, yeah, colleagues at NCAR, David, John, Judith, whom you'll hear um, from later in the school, and colleagues in Europe and in San Diego, like Judith mentioned. So, yeah, I presented this slide in our introductory um, talk on Monday. I'll not go over all the applications and the time scales and information again. But one thing I would like to emphasize in this plot, which I did not on Monday was the two orange lines, which, um, which are not highlighted in this figure in any way, but it is really key for using our information for applications in the society. So being able to give what's known as forecast uncertainty or how, um, uncertain or certain we are about our um, forecast on different time scales is really key for using that for decision making in societal applications. And a lot of what I'll talk about today is how do we get this right? How do we get our uncertainty right in our forecasts? And what does that imply um, both in terms of improving our models, but also improving the information we provide at different time scales? And as you will see in this figure, the uncertainty grows in time. And what we would like is our prediction systems also to reflect um, the same on growing the uncertainty and growing the uncertainty accurately. So just a brief outline of what I'll talk. I'll be giving a lot of um, introduction on um, how uncertainty grows in our system. What do we mean by ensemble prediction? Why do we need ensemble prediction and stochastic uh, perturbations in ensemble prediction systems. And then I'll touch upon some brief results on the impact of stochastic parameterization on uh, mean precipitation, a, lo a lot of work done by Antje over the last decade, and also sub-seasonal forecasts of the MJO, um, um, which is ongoing work. And then towards the end, I'll touch on machine learning for post-processing and stochastic parameterization. So yeah, we, um, we mentioned about the Ed Lawrence's concept of, of um, sensitivity to initial conditions and the whole concept of chaos, um, both in Joe's talk on the first day as well as in our um, fun debate um, on Tuesday. So Ed Lawrence came up with this really simple model, a three variable model the paper uh, was published in 1963 called Deterministic Non-Periodic um, Flows. 
this essentially it was not the first reference to chaos there have been um, there has been work done on chaos before but essentially i think lit a light or was a milestone in terms of understanding chaos in um, weather sciences and weather prediction. So the model is really simple. It's a three variable model uh, with nonlinear interactions and three parameters. It's a model for um, what's known as Rayleigh Bernard convection or convection of a flow, fluid flow between two plates, which are at different temperatures. And Ed Lawrence's um, paper and like following work that uh, really had an impact on ensemble prediction is this sensitivity to initial conditions. If we have small perturbations uh, in our initial conditions, how do they grow? And in a chaotic system, they would grow non-linearly. And that's essentially the concept of why, um, why we need to project uncertainty accurately, because we need to capture that error growth well. So I'll demonstrate this with a simple, um, schematic here. Uh, in a minute, I'll play an animation. What we did was to run the Lorentz model for a long period of time. And all these gray dots are solutions to those three equations over a long period of time. Um, and this is just for the x and z variable. You can think of this as the climate of the system. It's a climate attractor, or it's the space where all solutions of the model will lie. Then what I did was to pick like one value or one initial condition and then perturb that 50 times. So these um, red dots here, we have 50 different dots of uh, red uh, color. And I did this in three different locations of the attractor. So one over here uh, with um, a value of Z between 40 and 45 and X between minus 10 and 15. Another here, I initialize an ensemble here and another one here. And then I'll integrate the model forward in time um, and we'll see what happens in terms of the ensemble. How do these 50 um, members evolve in time? All of them were initialized very close to each other with just a small um, Gaussian noise added. And as we integrate forward in time, this is about 12 model time units. Um, you see different behavior in these 50 ensemble members as we integrate them through these um, 12. You can think of it as 12 or 15 uh, days of forecasts in the model, right? If we initialize them from this part of the attractor, they all stay close to each other for this time period. And the ensemble spread is low. If we think about this uh, location, the ensemble spread becomes large. And then as um, we get close to this um, region of bifurcation between these two regions of the attractor, we start seeing a divergence in the ensemble um, much before it, like closer to the initial condition. And here I call them as uh, predictable, semi-predictable and unpredictable because the uncertainty is really large um, in, the, uh, in the third case. And in the first case, the uncertainty is low. So if a true system was what I picked as the initial condition here, then all the ensembles will be able to predict that true system with low uncertainty here. This kind of an example can also be seen in um, the real world here, um, what I've shown below is three different examples of ensemble prediction of hurricane tracks or tropical cyclone tracks. One on the left here is for Hurricane Haiyan, which uh, impacted Philippines and um, the West Pacific region, Western Tropical Pacific. The colors here indicate the probability of um, occurrence of the tropical cyclone track the blue and purple colors show high probability, 80% 80, uh, 80 or above. And what we see here in the ECMWF ensemble system is all the ensemble members projected um, a similar track. The black dark line here is uh, what truly happened so that um, they all lie within the ensemble spread. On the, on the middle panel is the Hurricane Katrina, which brought a lot of destruction and death uh, to the Gulf Coast in US. 
here we see initially there was large probability of where um, it would go, large certainty, but then the spread became larger. And the third one was Hurricane Nadine, where it could either go out into the Atlantic or towards uh, Spain and have a big societal impact. So these are kind of examples where we want to um, predict the answer, uncertainty accurately in our uh, forecast. So what do we call a reliable ensemble forecast or what qualifies as a reliable ensemble forecast? A reliable ensemble forecast should provide realistic estimate of uncertainty in our forecasts. So um, this is just a cartoon of what we mean by a reliable ensemble. Here, what's plotted in the blue dots, um, you can think of it as ensemble estimates at some lead time. So let's say this is a, a 10 day forecast of different ensemble members um, for two meter temperature in Boulder. So they, we get different values of temperature from the different ensemble members. The white dot here represents the ensemble mean of all these uh, blue dots. And the red dot here, we can think of it as observations or the truth. So what we want in an ensemble is that this spread in the ensemble should equal the error in the ensemble mean because the ensemble mean is the best estimate of, um, of the forecast. So if this error in our uh, ensemble mean forecast matches the spread, then we would say that the ensemble is re re reliable, which means the uncertainty we get from the spread of the ensemble is um, similar to the error we have. Or in other words, the truth or the observation cannot be distinguished from the other ensemble members. So we can have unreliable forecasts, and there are two types of unreliable forecasts, as you might have guessed from this cartoon. One of them is the under dispersive ensemble or overconfident ensemble, where all the ensemble members are all close to each other. So the spread is small, but then the error is too large. So the from this kind of a forecast, we might think that the forecast uh, has low uncertainty, but uh, in reality, the error from the true observations is large. So this uncertainty is not useful and it's un under dispersive. Similarly, on the right, we have the over dispersive case where the uncertainty can be too large and the e error is small, but still, um, given the uncertainty is large, we cannot really make decisions um, based on this kind of an ensemble. So in terms of uncertainty in our forecast system, there are uh, two kinds or two main sources of uncertainty, uncertainty. One of them is the initial condition uncertainty that we just discussed um, related to the uh, Lawrence's uh, paper and idea of this sensitivity to initial perturbations. A second kind of uncertainty is model error. So this comes in from um, error in our subgrid scale parameterizations. So in our earth system models, which now um, is being used even for weather prediction, we have a fully uh, coupled earth system with the ocean, land surface processes, um, atmospheric processes, cryosphere, and all of these different processes um, act together to create our weather and um, climate over uh, subseasonal to seasonal to longer time scales, right? We need to represent all these processes. We have some kind of representation of all these processes, but um, uh, almost all of them are inaccurate. We make approximations in parameterizations. We make approximations, including in our dynamical equations. So this uncertainty or approximations need to be specified in our Earth system model. And there are two main contributions to this uncertainty. I'll quote uh, Donald Rumsfeld here, um, who was the US uh, Secretary of Defense back in the 2000s. Um, he got a, a lot of uh, flack. I think he even won a foot and mouth uh, prize for this. Um, he quoted that there are known knowns, there are things we know that we know, there are known unknowns. That is to say, there are things that we know, we now know that we don't know, but there are also unknown unknowns. There are things we do not know, we don't know. Um, and he quoted this in a political um, situation, which <laughs> the press and the large scale media did not take too kindly. Um, but then in our um, 
scientific respect, we can um, come back to this quote and it's relevant here as well. We, we know that there are known unknowns and there are also unknown unknowns. And I'll give a couple of examples here. Um, so in, in, let's think about convection as one problem. So uh, if we have convection in clouds, that would make some kind of a temperature perturbation through the atmospheric column. So let's think of that as this blue uh, line, which is the tendency of temperature at one given time step from convection alone. And then if we think of our discretized model, um, it's impossible to represent all the complexity of convection. Um, even the broad scale circulation of convection, our current generation weather and climate models don't resolve this. So we make uh, approximations and what are known as parameterizations of convection in our numerical model. And this uh, parameterized convection can give us some estimate of this convective heating or the temperature tendency um, in the model from convection, but this will uh, very likely and al almost always be uh, erroneous that um, it would not match what uh, the real world would get from a, con a similar convection. So there is this error and we know uh, that there, there is this error. So this, this is the known unknowns um, also called as epistemic errors or epistemic un uncertainty. And then there are these unknown unknowns, which is um, there are processes that are not resolved in the model. And here I, I call it as unknown unknowns because the model does not know about these processes. So an example is the upscale transport of kinetic energy um, to larger scales. Um, I just showed this cartoon here, which is an example of uh, 2D turbulence. We have a lot of eddies with uh, noise, but then uh, they also self-organize into jet-like features, which is an example of upscale transport of um, energy into these coherent structures. So both of these kind of uncertainties, the known unknowns and the unknown unknowns need to be uh, represented in our forecast system. I'll be just describing um, examples of how this is done in the ECMWF forecasting system. Um, the two um, methods of emulating uncertainty in the ECMWF system, the first kind, which is the uncertainty for initial conditions that is currently represented using these singular vectors that Joe uh, described on on Monday uh, in the on the first day's lecture. And uh, more recently, they've also added ensemble data simulation perturbations to represent this initial condition uncertainty. And the model uncertainty is represented uh, through two uh, different types of stochastic parameterization. This has been developed for more than two decades um, in ECMWF. Uh, Roberto Buitza's paper from 1999 um, was one of the first describing such an implementation of stochastic parameterization. Uh, Tim Palmer has a paper in 2009, which is a really good review of stochastic parameterization. Um, and then Antje has a paper um, more recently on implementation of this in the seasonal forecasting system. And Judith as well has a very good review in BAMS on why is stochastic parameterization important for weather and climate models. So the idea um, is, we put in these stochastic perturbations into our forecast model. We have um, some kind of perturbed initial conditions. This goes into the forecast model, but now with the stochastic uh, forcing, the forecast model is also different for um, each of these ensemble realizations. Previously, if we did not have any stochastic perturbations, every single ensemble member would get this exact same model physics integration. But now with these stochastic perturbations, um, the model is also different. So then that adds to the diversity in the solutions that we get. It's not only coming in from these initial perturbations, but also from the uh, stochastic perturbations in the model. So in ECMWF, and this might be technical, so if you don't follow it fully, that's okay. And we can talk about this later, but I'll go through this. Um, quickly. So in the ECMWF model uh, modeling system or forecasting system, currently the operational version 
um, uses two different types of uh, stochastic perturbation. The dominant one that is used is this uh, stochastically perturbed parameterization tendencies, which um, the idea essentially is you take these uh, tendencies, just as I gave the example of convection, you take the temperature or U and V winds or humidity tendency at every single time step. So you at one time step, you add up all the physics tendency in the model. And then you perturb it with a stochastic uh, uh, term, which is represented here. So X prime will be your stochastically perturbed tendency, which is equal to one plus the stochastic noise times this um, X tendency, which comes from the deterministic model integration. So this uh, perturbed tendency is what's used um, in, um, in the integration of the model at the next time step. And here the SPPT, it has three different spatial and temporal decorrelation length scales. So it, uh, you can think of it as an autoregressive uh, stochastic term. And each of them have different uh, standard deviations representing uncertainty in the mesoscale, synoptic scale, and uh, large scale um, variability. So this is, um, you can think of this scheme as representing um, uncertainty in known unknowns, the physics parameterizations that are implemented in the model. And then another type is the stochastic kinetic energy backscatter scheme, um, which Judith also has uh, worked a lot on. Um, this one tries to um, uh, represent a process that is not being resolved in the model. So it's upscale transfer of energy uh, from subgrid scales to large scales. It's uh, representing how um, momentum uh, is transferred upscale um, and it uses stochastic random 3D patterns um, to represent how much of the energy is partitioned into upscale versus dissipating out of the system. And then uh, more recently, ECMWF has been testing uh, what's known as stochastically perturbed parameters where um, the different parameters that are part of the parameterization schemes are perturbed um, prior to the physics integration. So if you, if you think of um, convection, for instance, you have uh, different parameterizations to represent microphysics or uh, convective uh, closures. Uh, so these parameters or coefficients are perturbed or are drawn from PDFs, um, such as these, uh, such as this uh, um, schematic presented here. And uh, there's, I think, 20 or there's a lot of different parameters that are cataloged and um, they have been cataloging and studying how much uncertainty are there in these uh, parameters and how do we add these um, or draw these parameters from PDF, different types of PDFs. So this again uh, is a different approach. This one, um, you add uncertainty before you do the physics integration and you expect the models, uh, physical integrations to propagate this uncertainty in parameters into the output variables of the system. What I'll be presenting is largely impacts of SPPT, the first stochastic scheme I described. Um, so these stochastic perturbations not only impact ensemble forecasts and they not only have an effect on the ensemble spread or uncertainty in our forecast, um, but recent work uh, led by Antje and others um, at Oxford have also shown that they have an impact on the mean state of the model or the mean state biases in the model, they help improve uh, low frequency variability also, even though the perturbations are at higher frequencies, uh, they have an impact on the long-term uh, climate of the system. So this is an example of the mean state bias and precipitation in the ECMWF system. Uh, the top left is observed precipitation from uh, this product called GPCP. The bottom two plots are showing precipitation bias. Um, so two experiments were conducted, uh, seasonal forecasting experiments over a um, 30 year period. One of them, there was no stochastic perturbations in the model and the model was run uh, for seasonal time scales. And then you collect 30 years and you uh, compute the mean precipitation in the model and you take a difference from the observations and what 
Um, this will show us is where is precipitation biased in the model. So what we see here in the blue colors are increased precipitation in the model compared to the observation. So the model has too much precipitation in the ITCZ region, in the Indian Ocean region, the SPCZ region in the Southern Pacific, and similarly in the Atlantic. And then another experiment was conducted where stochastic physics was active in the system. And uh, here too, we see this increased bias that the model has more precipitation. But even with I, you can see that the bias uh, is reduced compared to the stochastics of case. And that's shown in the top right panel here, which is the difference with, between the stochastics of and stochastics on case. And here, what we see is that the ITCZ region and the South Pacific region and maritime continent, there is increased precipitation when the stochastics off is switched off, which means that adding stochastic perturbations helps reduce this mean precipitation bias in the model. And then what's the impact of stochastic physics on the Madden-Julian oscillation, which is now uh, looking at intraseasonal variability in the model? Um, this again is looking at a similar experiment where we did uh, sensitivity studies of, of the different scales in the uh, SPPT scheme and how it impacts MJO prediction. So um, don't pay attention to all the different colors. They're um, the blue, green, and uh, purple, purple colors are um, the different SPPT experiments. What I would like you to pay attention to is the red, the difference between the red color where there's no stochastic perturbations and the other colors where there is stochastic perturbations. And what we see is at least in the first two to three weeks, there's a, a big impact in terms of stochastic perturbations help um, increase the skill of the model in terms of MGO prediction. And this is um, predicting the MGO PC1 or RMM1 and RMM2, the two components of the MGO uh, phase space. And then um, some results from climate model experiments. Um, we have done, um, so led by the group in Italy, Paolo Davini, Susanna Corti, and Joost von Hardenberg, in collaboration with the group in Oxford, have run um, climate model simulations um, with the IFS ECMWF uh, system for um, yeah, climate time scales, 10 year long integrations at different resolutions. So we uh, compared mo climate model simulations without stochastic physics, which is plotted on the left and with stochastic physics, which is plotted on the right. The middle panel is the observed uh, fields. What's plotted is the correlation of precipitation in an Indian Ocean box. So it's um, 70 to 90 east. We take an average uh, precipitation in that box. We compute a time series and we do a lead lag correlation. Um, lag is uh, minus 30 day lag on the y axis to plus 30 days um, uh, on the y axis. So this Propagating signal in correlation is uh, corresponding to how precipitation for the MJO starts in the West Indian Ocean and then propagates through the maritime continent um, across all the way to the dateline. The line contours are wind um, correlation showing convergence into this region. What we see here is the control run uh, does not have much of this signal of propagation, but when we add stochastic physics, we see at least in uh, some of the ensemble members, we get an improved representation of this propagation of the MGO. And uh, Hannah Christensen has done work um, in collaboration with Judith, um, looking at similar diagnostics in the NCAR CESM model. We see some improvement in the system, and this is ongoing work where we are um, further analyzing why we see this improvement and how statistically significant this signal is. Now briefly in the next uh, three or four minutes, I'll touch upon quickly um, some machine learning ideas on improving um, both stochastic um, parameterization and ensemble predictions. Um, so the first work I'll present is work led by Will, um, who's a grad student at Scripps, who's also a student of this summer school. Um, we looked at how do we use uh, convolutional neural networks, um, a type of machine learning method uh, to improve post-processing of 
atmospheric river forecast. The idea essentially is similar to image processing. So convolutional neural networks can be thought of different layers of uh, parameters and we can give it an input. For instance, here we give it um, either cat figures or dog figures, but then we train the network parameters to identify cat figures um, specifically. So we train it with a, a, a training data set of cats. And then if we give this two different type of inputs, it will be able to tell us if the input was a cat or not. Um, and the way this is done um, is we use like um, a cost function and we compute gradients to minimize this cost function. That's what is shown in this um, um, cartoon below. It's essentially optimizing parameters um, in this convolutional neural network and the optimal set, which is the minima here in the cost function will give us the best set of parameters to do this prediction uh, in an image sense. So can we use uh, modern, these kind of modern deep learning neural networks to operate on image data to improve upon our dynamical forecasting systems? Um, and, and can this also inform on um, broader scale patterns rather than just looking at station data and improving or post-processing statistics of individual grid points. And once this neural network is trained, it's fast and cheap to implement for post-processing. So we did uh, do work, this is published now, uh, where we showed that implementing such a conv convolutional neural network can help improve uh, prediction of integrated vapor transport, which is relevant, relevant for atmospheric river forecast. So the blue colors here um, indicate improvement in skill um, of this model to predict atmospheric rivers. And then um, one idea to extend, so that was all work done in a deterministic sense of uh, just one deterministic forecast of the AR, how do we post-process it? Um, ideas on improving ensemble forecasts, there are more uh, modern techniques in machine learning called Bayesian neural networks that draw samples from probability distributions and the lost functions are also defined based on probabilistic uh, skill scores such as CRPS. Um, CRPS. So we are exploring using these methods to improve ensemble forecasts as well and will as work uh, using CNNs as well to uh, improve ensemble forecasts um, of um, vapor transport in the uh, Pacific. So I just wanted to highlight this one data set that is now available online. Um, this work was led by Sue Ellen Hopped, who will be talking later um, in this summer school about use of machine learning for po post-processing and um, other aspects as well. So it's uh, a recent workshop in Oxford and this came out of it where we have um, posted data sets that can be used as um, benchmarks and training data sets for machine learning methods uh, based on large scale indices such as MJO, PNA. Then one final uh, remark in the next minute or so, I'll uh, quickly go through. Um, yeah, somewhat recently in the last couple of years, David John Gagne led this work um, as um, yeah, Hannah Christensen, Adam Monahan, and I were collaborators on this where we used the Lorenz 96 model, a two variable system where the Y variable, the high frequency variable is coupled to this lower frequency X variable and it's coupled through this um, term. And that can be thought of as a subgrid scale forcing to this X variable. So then what we want to do is to parameterize this. We don't integrate the Y variable, but we parameterize this term. Um, and how do we do this with machine learning? So we use the um, machine learning method called GANs, Generative Adversarial Networks, which essentially has two types of networks, a generator, um, which generates samples or synthetic samples uh, that are similar to the training data set. And then we have a discriminator um, or a critic network, which essentially checks if this synthetic sample is part of the true sample or not. And the more we do this check uh, and give feedback to this uh, generator network, then it can correct itself and improve the uh, output that it gives. So we did this for the X and U variable in the Lorentz model. And 
the output would, would be the subgrid scale tendency at the next time step, which is what we want. And we were able to do this in a stochastic term because the GANs, we can add noise within the neural networks uh, to generate stochastic perturbation. So we tested a few different uh, configurations of this. I'll not go into details here, uh, just highlights. We tested white noise and red noise um, inputs into these GANs. And we ran these for like climate time scales and weather time scales. And our benchmark uh, was this polynomial um, uh, parameterization, which is similar to deterministic parameterizations in weather and climate models. And we show from all these different configurations of these uh, stochastic GAN machine learning methods, there are a few configurations that can improve upon the deterministic um, deterministic parameterization of subgrid scale tendencies. So I will stop here um, and take questions maybe for the next five, um, five or 10 minutes. I'm sorry to go over time. So. No, no, you're not over time at all. Thank you so much. Yes. Amazing, one minute. That's okay. Thank you so much. That was a very comprehensive introduction to uncertainty uh, representation and then also linking it to processes. Mm -hmm.